it was, so just bear with me. Uh, uh, online stuff, there's stuff on there. Jack's lesson was great this morning. Book of Proverbs is so fitting for this time, and uh, so I hope you'll tune in on that. I know uh, uh, there's also children's messages on there, so if you'll get those. And uh, Renee did a devotion this week. I think it's on there. So uh, from time to time, and uh, there's some regular schedule stuff on there. Uh, but just uh, keep checking uh, on those things. I know they're there for you, and it gives you a way to stay in touch with sort of some of the ministries here of the church. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be in the book of James, and we're going to read verse 7 through verse 11 this morning. Verse 7 through verse 11. Now, I've entitled this Patience, Please, uh, and you'll see why in just a moment. Verse 7 of James chapter 5. James actually starts out speaking to a group of rich Jewish Christians. Uh, many of them had, uh, he reminds them that the wealth and the riches they have obtained uh, will vanish away. They'll be rotted. They'll become cankered. Uh, those things that they've invested in are going to rust and fade away. And uh, they need to be sure that they lay up treasures for the last days as you Look at this first part of this chapter. Uh, and then when we get to verse 6, uh, I believe they had got to that place where they had begun to condemn and kill others, and, uh, uh, the just, those that uh, were uh, standing for righteousness, and much like what we're seeing today. And he writes, verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, to the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth, and has long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be you also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws near. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Pray with me. Father, thank you again today for the freedom, the honor, and the privilege of being able to read the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, today that we can sing and we can celebrate and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in the days in which we live. Thank you, Lord, today for the faithfulness of your people. If they've left many of their homes to come here today and face the threats of COVID-19. And Lord, I pray again, I pray, Lord, you'd help us today, Lord, to not only hear the word of God, but may we receive it and may we apply it to our lives today in the manner and the fashion you'd be pleased with. God, help us today. We're at your mercy today, Father, to hear from heaven in these days in which we live. God, I pray today you'd help me to take the thoughts you've laid upon my heart. May I preach them, Lord, with clearness and preciseness. Lord, I pray that folks would see you and not me. I pray, dear God, that I would uh, decrease, that you might increase today in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Uh, I think most of us would agree this morning as we sit in this church that there are some things that are vitally important to us. I know there's some things that stand out to me. Uh, I believe today that our faith is important. Uh, I believe that you show that today because you're in attendance here. Many of you watch online when you aren't here. Uh, and you read your Bibles and you pray and you, you try to follow God. I believe our faith is important. I believe our family is important. My family is important. I, I die for my family. Uh, my family, my wife, and my children, my grandchildren. Listen, you want to get on my bad side, you start messing with my family. And most of you could say the same thing this morning. I, I think our future, uh, our future is important to me. Uh, our future is important to us. The future of my grandchildren, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. The future of the church and the future of this nation is at my heart. It's important to me. And I realize today, folks, as we look around, there is a movement today uh, that, is, that is not for social justice, it's for socialism. Uh, the Judeo-Christian values of this country are no longer important to many today that are flooding the streets of America. Uh, There's some today that want to destroy the family, uh, and they're doing everything they can in some of these movements to destroy the role of the man in our culture. 
And if they can take the man or the husband out of the role in the family, they think they'll succeed and bring it in this root of socialism. There are some today that want to remove the foundations of our history. Folks, like it or not, we are a founded Christian nation. Amen. Do the math. Do the history. It's relevant. It's there. You cannot change history. Yes, we've made mistakes. Yes, our forefathers have made blunders. But folks, there's a whole lot better better good things than there are bad things. Uh, We have a culture today that wants to remove not only the, the man from our culture, the man in the family, the role of the man in the church, but we want to remove church from culture. There's a generation today that thinks that the, that the church is a bunch of old fuddy duds. They're narrow. They're legalist. They're bigots. Folks, that's so far from the truth. The church has done more for America, more for our country than anybody, any other organization there is. They want to remove, folks, there's even folks who want to remove God from the future. And the video that I'm going to show proves some of what I'm saying. And I'll not leave all the statistics here this morning, but you'll watch that and you'll see some of the things going on. But our faith, our family, and our future are vitally important to us. But but I also believe that Satan has some vital important things to him. Uh, There's a threefold goal when it comes to his assault on God's children or the church. And I want to give them to you. They're found right here in the context of what James is writing in these four some verses in this text. First of all, uh, Satan's desire is to discourage you while waiting. Now, James is going to begin to use the farmer and the prophets and also Job to present his message. He's going to use them as typologies or illustrations to show what he's trying to say. So understanding that, keep in mind, Let me just go ahead and make a statement here, folks. (laughs) We need to be reminded, folks, that God's not going to right all the wrongs in this present world. There's some things that are never going to get right. We might as well face that. But there's some things that we can get right, and there's some things that are taking place and will take place if we'll follow God that will happen. But Satan's desire overall is to discourage you while waiting. Notice he says, Be patient, therefore, brethren. First of all, uh, as we think about Satan's desire to discourage us while we're waiting on the return of the Lord, first of all, we need to live with endurance. Uh, we may, we got to live with endurance. That's what he says in verse 7. He says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, to the coming of the Lord. Look at verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and seen the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Let's stop there for just a moment. Look at, look at the, the point. We must live with endurance as we wait for the return of the Lord. Notice uh, that word patient. That word patient is the same word we have. It's actually the, the Greek word endurance. Uh, it means to remain under. It means to stay put and stand fast when you'd like to run away and hide. Any of you had days like that lately? <laughs> On the job when folks don't want to pitch a fit about this and pitch a fit about that. And I'm not going to get in that too deep. Uh, but anyhow, uh, you look at the culture and where it's going and the things that are happening. But it means to stay put and stand fast when you like to run away and hide. Listen, there's some times, listen, I, I'm in the boat with you. I'd like to run away and hide. But listen, we can't do that. We've got to stand firm. We've got to be bold. God's put us here uh, for a divine reason. We've got to stay put. We've got to stand fast. And we've got to be bold in these days we, in which we live. That's what he means by being patient. We need endurance. We must live with endurance, folks. You don't know why we're here today? It's because our forefathers lived with endurance. They stood fast. They stood for what's right, regardless of what the consequences were in their life. Secondly, we must live in expectation. Look at verse 7 again. Be patient, therefore, brethren, to the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband, the farmer, waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. We must live in expectation. Folks, I don't know about you, but as I look around and I see things developing around me, I, 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 I anticipate more and more every day the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Why should we live with endurance? Why should we live in expectation? Well, he gives us yeah, three times in these short verses. Uh, he reminds us, verse 7, verse 8, and verse 11, you'll find tucked in there three times James reminds us that Jesus is coming. Can I remind you today, church, well, Jesus is coming, amen? It's sooner now than it's ever been, and I believe with all my heart, the stage is being set today across not only in America, but across this world for Jesus to return to bring his church home. John 16, 33, uh, Jesus said, These things have I spoken to you, that in you might, you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. He, he's already prophesied of that. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Thank God for that verse. Hey, yes, you're going to have tribulation. No, we're not going to live through the tribulation, that period of seven years of God's wrath and judgment, but there it will be tribulation on the earth. We can expect that. We understand that. And we need to live in expectation. And it shouldn't catch us by surprise. It shouldn't come as a thief in the night. Folks, we ought to be ready, and we should be ready when these things begin to develop and happen which they are now he says be of good cheer I have overcome the world thank God thank God that Jesus Christ has overcome the world through his death burn resurrection Acts chapter 14 verse 22 uh, Paul writes confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God why why should we live with endurance? Why should we live in expectation? Why? Because Satan's desire is to discourage you while waiting. You see, number one, while we're waiting, God is producing a harvest in our lives. That's what James is saying. He says God's producing a harvest in our lives. He says, be patient therefore, brethren, to the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Folks, God's producing a harvest in your life, in my life, and in the church's life. Well, what's the secret of endurance in our lives? James answers it by using the farmer's patience. What does the farmer do? He gets the seed. He takes the seed, he gets the soil right, he places it in the soil, he does all that work, he, he, he's very careful how he does it, and he waits on the weather, and he watches the weather concerning his crop. It's not a hasty process. I, I'm reminded of that as I sowed my garden in the spring. I got the, the till, like I never got a tiller to run, but when I did, uh, I got it tilled it up, got everything ready, uh, dropped those seeds, and, and, and then finally everything began to happen. I, I lived in anticipation, waiting for that squash and that zucchini, and now we're getting green beans by the groves and, and tomatoes about that big around with Duke's mayonnaise and salt and pepper. And Renee says, listen, she says, I don't care if I don't lose another pound, I'm going to have me a, a tomato sandwich on some bread with Duke's mayonnaise. And I said, amen, I'll stick at that. I'm going to eat one too. Amen. Y'all with me? Yeah. Wow. And we got one fellow told me he had mayonnaise with avocado or something. I'm going to buy a jar to sit. I'm going to give it to him. It's not any good. Okay. But anyhow, God's producing a harvest in our lives. That's what he's saying. You see, the early rains he refers to would soften the soil and the latter rains would come in the springtime. The harvest would be waiting for. Hey, you may be going through tough times now. It may be rough right now. And it may look like that, listen, uh, the, the storms are be becoming vehemently in your life. And it may be that things are uncertain. But let me remind you, God's still on the throne. He's not asleep. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He knows what's going on. He's got this thing under control. Uh, Galatians 6, 9, Paul says, Let us not be weary and well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not amen he uses the farmer to show us that God is producing a harvest in our lives and one day everything's going to be ripe it's going to be ripe for the coming of the Lord folks I can't help but to believe that we're almost to that place where we've become ripe for the judgment of God in our nation it's evident it's apparent, and I can't make, make an excuse for that. It's here. God's producing a harvest in our lives. Secondly, I believe God's establishing your heart. It needs to be established in your heart. Look what he said in verse 8. He says, be you also patient. 
And then he used it, he said, establish your hearts. That word establish means to strengthen. He said, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near. It's been drawing near, it's getting near, and it's going to be here. God is establishing your heart. That word strengthen. The New Living Translation actually says, you must be patient and take courage. Uh, that, the word strengthen here that he uses in this, te- the word establish uh, means to strengthen. It, it, it speaks of stability. It, 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 mean, it means to have tenacity, reliability. Uh, it means to have just a little bit of stubbornness. Amen? It means to have some determination. Actually, it gets so extreme that it means just to be dogmatic about some things. Amen? And I've made up my mind, there's some things, uh, like it or lump it, when it comes to this word and the will of God, listen, I'm going to be dogmatic about it. Amen? Doesn't matter what the Democrats say. Doesn't matter what the Republicans say. Doesn't matter what our governor says. There's some things I'm going to respect and authority, but I'm going to be dogmatic when it comes to what God says. Amen. Bottom line. You see, Colossians 1.23 says, Paul says, continue in the faith grounded and settled. <laughs> he says, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Ephesians 6.13, Paul says, uh, Take the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Folks, we've got to stand. We've got to stand for what's right. God wants to produce a harvest in our life and the devil knows that. And Satan's desire is to discourage you while you're waiting. But while we're waiting, we've got to live with endurance. We have to live in expectation. And there has to be a motivation and an eagerness about us to produce a harvest in our lives and to establish our hearts. Let God move in our hearts and make us confidence. Give us confidence and help us to be what we need to be. And give us courage so that we might be what we need to be in this world. Number two, Satan's desire is not only to, uh, is to discourage you while waiting, but James says Satan's desire in verse 9 is to distract you from serving God. He says, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. What's he saying here? Uh, stop and think about it. We've got some farmers in here, and we've got some guys that have been around farming, raised in farming. Most farmers have little time to grumble with their neighbors, do they? You know what they do? Most of them, if they're not out in the fields working and planting and taking care of the crop, they're over somewhere working on a tractor. They're keeping up the barn. Uh, They're making sure that all the bills are paid and they're getting everything. They're usually working day in and day night because the harvest is coming. And if the harvest is not coming, they're doing something until it does come. And every farmer I've ever watched, they live day to day, sun up to sundown doing something. And that's what he's trying to show us in the portrait here of this farmer. Satan's desire is to distract you from serving God. And the farmer illustrates for us that the farmer doesn't have time to grumble and gripe and complain with his neighbors. They're busy working, trying to bring people to God, trying to get the harvest in. You see, most farmers, you know what they do? Uh, They see another farmer down the road in need, and you know what they do? Most of the time, they usually arise to occasion to help out. I know we remember back when we had the drought. Some of our North Carolina farmers took uh, uh, bales of hay and trailer loads of hay up north into the Mideast where they were, didn't have any uh, product to feed their cattle. Many of them hauled bales of hay by the, by the thousands. And then in return, they brought stuff down here. Uh, what a blessing it was to see those farmers. Even Willie Nelson, I think, and some of the country music singers done some type of concert to raise funds for the farmers because they were scrounging and things had bottomed out. Folks, it's those types of things that have made our country what they are today. You see, the truth displayed here in in this portrait of this farmer is this. The truth is, is impatience with God. Listen to me. Impatience with God leads to impatience with people. That's what he's trying to say to this group of men. You know, if we're not careful, we'll chop our own. We'll chop our own to shreds if we're not careful. Folks, that's what's happening all over America. Because of a mask. I've never seen so many people act so ugly over a a, a mask. Really? Really? I'm talking about Christian people. In public, 
places where there's gatherings of people. I, I talk to people all the time. You don't know why? Because we don't respect each other. Because instead of working together, Satan's trying to pull us apart. Now, we all have preferences and we have things. And I'm not picking on anybody. Where's the master? Don't worry. But don't let that rule your life. Don't let it take charge of you that you become arrogant and obnoxious. It doesn't bother me. I wear a mask for the protection of my wife. I, I, I'm not worried. Personally. And there's places I go, I don't wear one. I'll go ahead and tell you. But folks, we've made it such an issue. We, we've made it a dividing line. We've decided who's spiritual and who's not spiritual because of a flipping mask. Really, we have. And guess what? There's some folks that wore masks and they've done everything right. They've washed their hands and they've done everything right and they've still got COVID-19. Right. I don't know how I got off on this. That's just a soapbox. Right. Look, use a little common sense. Don't let the devil use those things to divide us. Satan's desire is to distract you, listen to me, in any way he can to get you from serving God. And if he can turn you against one of your uh, brothers and sisters in Christ because, because of anything, he'll use it, he'll take it, and he'll manipulate our culture. And folks, that's what's happening today in America. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, the problem is that we're facing something that's very difficult. And we've got to be respectful, and we've got to work together, and we've got to find, we've got to pray for a cure and an answer. But till then, we ain't got time to argue and fuss and fight and bellyache and gripe and complain. And, and if you're not careful, your impatience with God will lead you to impatience with people and vice versa. Thirdly, Satan's desire is not to distract you from serving God. Look at verse 10. Satan's desire is to deceive you into disobeying God. He said, take my brethren the prophets. Now he's going to use the prophets, for example, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Remember what Matthew chapter 5 said. Listen here. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through verse 13, Jesus said this. He said, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for, glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. As I think about what Jesus said, you see, when we've lost that savor, that vigor, We've got to the place where we've lost our influence to penetrate this culture. We're, we're, in, a, we're, in, a bad, we're a, in a desolate place. And Satan's desire is, is to deceive us into disobeying God so that we'll lose our effectiveness. And that's what Jesus was saying there. You see, we're to be the light and we're to be the salt of the earth. We're to penetrate this world that's filled with sin. We're to shed light on darkness. And when we get away from that emphasis... And that's what Satan's goal is. He wants us to lose that emphasis and get our em emphasis on something else so we won't do God's will. His desire is to deceive you into disobeying God. Well, what encouragement can we find in the prophets? That's the, that's the question. Why does James say that? Ladies and gentlemen, they were in the will of God and still suffered. Think about it for just a moment. The prophets were in the will of God and they still suffered. I'm reminded as I thought about, I've been reading a book of Adoram Judson, who was a, a missionary to Burma between southern India and China. Listen to this, this, just a moment, the, the excerpt from his life for just a moment. I don't want to give you all of it, but just think about it for a moment. They were in the will of God and still suffered. You see, the Judsons spent 10 years learning to speak the Burmese language. They had no no. Uh, knowledge of the dialect at all. It took Adoram six years later to be able to preach his first sermon after he learned the language. Uh, he preached 12 years before he had, ever, he had seen 18 delivered from Buddhism and be baptized believers. Adoniram went to the emperor of Burma to petition freedom to preach the gospel openly without the threat of uh, prison, persecution, or death. And the emperor looked at him read a few lines and threw the gospel track on the ground and walked away. 
Five years later, uh, after that, they finally received a printing press in Burma. And they began to, were able to print the gospel of Matthew by thousands of copies and begin to hand it out in the streets. On June 8, 1824, Judson was dragged from his home. He was tied up and dragged away in front of his wife and his cohorts that he had led to Christ. Judson lay on the floor in a Burmese prison. His feet in stocks and iron chains that weighed 14 pounds each held him to the floor. At night, a bamboo pole was passed through the prisoners' uh, shackled feet and hoist, they were hoisted up by pulleys so that they hung upside down and the tips of their heads and sometimes their shoulders would touch the ground. Once Judson was caged in a cage for days that housed the lion. It wasn't high enough for him to stand and it wasn't long enough for him to lay down. If you read the rest of his biography, Judson's wife died. Uh, he had a child that was stillborn. He had another daughter that was born and she also died. And not previously three months after his wife and his daughter died, his father died. If you read the rest of the story, he went on into a great, great time of depression to one of his family members accepted Jesus Christ. And it was during him finding that out that his life was renewed and restored and he began to interpret the scriptures again and do God's will. What am I trying to say? Here's a man who's left everything to go uh, to present the gospel in a place where they haven't even heard of God. And here's a man. Uh, he, he's doing the will of God, yet he still suffered. Folks, I don't know what you're going to go through. I don't know what you're facing this morning. But listen, the Bible says uh, that those who live in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Uh, Timothy says, yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, he didn't say might, he said will suffer persecution. I don't know what we're going to face till we get out of here, but I just know this. I'm glad Satan's desire is to deceive you into disobeying God. If he can put pressure on you, you think you don't deserve Guess what? Uh, there's no, we see many that have come before us and gone on before us. They didn't deserve it either, but they faced it. They were in the will of God and they still suffered. We have a great misconception today in this name it, claim it stuff. Boy, if you'll just give your heart and life to the Lord, everything will be okay. If you'll just give your heart and life to the Lord, you can drive a Cadillac or you can have a fine house or you can have a place on the lake or down at the beach. If you'll just do this, if you'll just give your heart and life to God, you'll live on Easy Street, folks. That is not a doctrine found in the Scriptures. God will provide your needs. And most of the time, He'll provide some of your wants, but He's not obligated to let you live like that. Secondly, the prophets were in the will of God and still suffered. Second thing I want you to know about the prophets is they were cared for by God through their suffering. Remember Elijah as he faced King Ahab, wicked King Ahab? He said, listen, it's not going to rain. There's going to be no rain. And uh, he, but he, he, he fled and <clears throat> uh, the Bible tells the whole story. There's a great drought come and he went down by the brook Cherith and he was fed and watered daily by God. But at the same time, think about Jeremiah just a moment. Jeremiah was arrested as a traitor and thrown into a well to die. Think about Daniel who stood, stood against Nebuchadnezzar. He was thrown into a den of lions and he was, in, he, was, he was thrown into a fiery furnace because he would not bow to the false images of that culture. Someone said, you may have heard it before, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. And I say, Amen. And I think as James writes this letter to these Jewish brethren, there's some things we, we need to understand. We'll come back to Job next time, next week, okay? But as we stop there and we, we look at the prophets and we look at the farmer, like the farmer, we, we keep working and waiting. And that's all we can do, folks, is just keep working and waiting. Like the prophet, we keep watching and witnessing. And you need to make up your heart and mind, just like James says, that you're going to show your patience by doing three things. Number one, waiting on God. Now, waiting on God doesn't mean that we sit down. You've heard me say so many times and play armchair quarterback. It doesn't mean we sit down and quit like some were doing in Thessalonica as they had heard about the coming of the Lord. And Paul began to rebuke them in chapter 4. Uh, and you've seen that go on through the years of different compounds and different cults through the years. Folks, 
We need to show our patience by waiting on God. Waiting on God. Keep on doing the things you know to do till you know to do something else. Be consistent. Your children, your grandchildren, those today that are around you today that are living in darkness, they need you to be light. They need you to understand that, listen, you haven't backed out, you haven't let down, you're going to stand firm on the Word of God, and you're still looking for Jesus Christ to come for you. Why? Because the Bible says so. You're waiting on God. You're looking As Titus said, you're looking for His appearing. You're loving His appearing. You're longing for His appearing. Waiting on God. Secondly, I believe we can show our patience by serving God. We can't do a whole lot right now. Most of us are in positions of stuff in the church, teaching, and it's just so many things have changed our life. But there's more ways that you can serve God. Uh, There's some folks that have done all kinds of things. during. Some people have been making masks. Some people, for those who want to wear a mask and need to wear a mask, there's folks today that are doing all types of things. Uh, we've got folks that are doing things online here to try to get you the messages. There's folks that are doing things in the community in different places. D- d- find some way to serve. I ne- and I, you've heard me say this. I, I, I never dreamed that I'd be take, going handing out eggs. <laughs> but it's been a blessing. And the gentleman that's bringing them to me, it it, it just thrills his heart when he says, hey, do you want some more eggs? And He says, if you ever get a place you don't want them, just tell me. He said, but I just enjoy doing this because I know I'm helping people. He said, I can't preach. He said, I can't teach. He said, I'm not even able to go to church because of my wife's condition and my condition. I'm I'm having to stay at home. And he's a goer. Uh, He's a second oldest goings. He says, I just want to serve doing something. Just find somewhere to serve. It may be a card. It may be a phone call. It may be a letter. I don't know. But folks, there's a lot of people discouraged right now. Find a way to serve. And then thirdly, not only we show our patience by waiting on God and serving God, but just by obeying God. 